Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Cooperative. This morning, we have the pleasure of having Renee Hatcher on. She is an attorney and... She's the director of the Community Enterprise and Solidarity Economy Clinic at the University of Illinois in Chicago and their John Marshall Law School. <laughs> Good morning, Renee. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me, Vernon. Oh, thank you for being on this first Thursday in the month that celebrates Women's History Month. Thank you so much for being on, taking time out to come and share with us about history and about what's going on today and what's happening in the future, what you would like to see happening. So, Renee, let's start off. What is this director of the Community Enterprise and Solidarity Economy Clinic? What is that clinic? What is that? Great, great. Thanks for asking. So I'm the director, again, as you said, the Community Enterprise and Solidarity Economy Clinic, and that is at UIC John Marshall Law School here in Chicago. Um, and essentially what we do is we provide free legal services really to both businesses, organizations, community associations, um, really trying to focus on and emphasize the need to uh, provide legal support to the solidarity economy here in Chicago locally. Uh, and so we provide legal representation to co-ops of all kinds. We focus a lot on worker centers and worker co-ops. Uh, We represent nonprofit organizations. And in addition to that, we do a lot of legal support really around issues of racial justice, around economic justice, and um, trying to provide the kinds of services really that our community partners and taking the cue from them in terms of what they need. So we represent clients, we do advocacy work, we do policy work, and all of this is uh, manned mostly by law students who are in their second or third year that are supervised by myself and my colleagues. So really what we're trying to do is provide legal support to further the self-determination of communities and to uh, really flourish uh, and do what we can to see the solidarity economy locally flourish here in Chicago. So what do you mean by solidarity economy? What what do you mean by that? Yeah, thank you for that, Um, because I think uh, it's a term that I hope more and more people have heard of. Um, But really, the solidarity economy is about transforming the current dominant economy to one that simply centers the needs of people and the planet, right? And so moving away from this idea of maximizing profit or increasing the wealth of a very, very small number of people in this country, how do we actually transform and shift the economy to one that ensures that people have everything that they need? to live a dignified life, to flourish, and also that's aligned with, you know, the boundaries of our resources in terms of this climate crisis. Um, And so simply put, again, like the solidarity economy is is trying to transform the economy today by supporting and developing the types of both economic and social initiatives, whether they're businesses or organizations, that really fulfill the needs of people. And it's, it's the idea of it being that it's grassroots, it's ground up, that people in their own communities actually know best what they need. They need to have agency in actually receiving those services or products and, you know, more or less trying to create an economy that works for everyone. So when I think of solid, solidarity, I think that we're all together like a block. We're working together. We're moving together. And what I hear you saying, though, is that, that everybody, this togetherness, is so that everybody has what they, their needs, their basic needs, food, shelter, education, health care, and you want an economy that does that. And when you say as opposed to the dominant economy, I think of the capitalistic economy, which is built in, not in a bad way necessarily, 
Greed. Greed says, I want for me and me only. That's the And I went to get my MBA with that in mind. I wanted to build something for me. I'd bought into that. And on the surface, I don't think anything wrong with that, except that it turns out that too often people will try to hurt other people to get more. And you're wanting to build a whole different kind of economy. Is that what I'm getting from you? Exactly. Well, the capitalism is built on the exploitation of people. And again, moving beyond this idea of the me to the collective um, to ensure that people aren't exploited, that they have their basic needs met, and also that they have more ownership and agency over their own lives, their communities. Right. So we talk a lot about issues of gentrification. Uh, what does it look like when a community actually has control over the businesses that move in or actually actual ownership over them? What does it look like when uh, workers actually own the place that they work in so they're directly benefiting from their labor as well as having a say in what their working conditions look like? Um, and so I would say that the dominant economy, that capitalism, is inherently problematic, right, for, specifically for those that are um, most oppressed in this country, the communities that are most marginalized, um, so black folks and Latinx folks and folks with disabilities and women. By and large, the system is built on the ex- exploitation of a certain, certain groups of people. And so what we want to do in terms of the solidarity economy is really put people in control and to increase not only political democracy, but economic democracy, so people actually have more say in terms of what their lives look like and what the conditions are that they both work in and live in and the things that they have access to. Well, this is what you just described is the reason I like co-ops, and I have it that capitalists are concerned about three things, three Ps, uh, and the same co-ops are concerned about three things. I'll start with P. Co-ops are concerned about people first, planet second, and profit third. And that, and that sort of, that's what co-ops are concerned about. And that's why this solidarity works for having co-ops because people are very much involved in that in the planet. Where capitalists are concerned about three things with a P2. They, first, they're concerned about profit. Second, they're concerned about profit. And third, they're concerned about profit. Anything else, uh, maybe, but as long as focus on profit. What is the return on investment? That's profit. That was the in my MBA program. That was everything. Every decision was based on what gives you the best return on investment to the shareholder who may not live in that community. Most likely did not. So it's extractive. What you talked about it takes the money out of the community into the hands of a the one percenters in our in our world. All right. So I love what you're doing. I love what you're doing. Do you like what you yeah. do? Oh, I love what I do. And, you know, on that point, in terms of the concerns of co-ops, one of the reasons why, um, so co-ops are a large part of the solidarity economy. And one of the reasons why I think uh, the solidarity economy kind of theory and movement is helpful is because it goes beyond co-ops in thinking about racism and thinking about sexism and thinking about ableism and thinking about heteronormativity. Right. So this idea of anti-oppression also is integral to the solidarity economy, even thinking beyond co-ops. Right. We know sometimes that in terms of both the perception and what's put out there is that the co-op movement has been seen as a very white movement. And rarely is it explicit about the need to uh, incorporate uh, a perspective and a lens that really gets at issues of oppression. Um, and so I think the solidarity economy is, is, again, explicit about that and is the only way in which we are really going to get beyond to an actual new system, right? So there's nothing new about a system that continues to oppress black folks and Latinx folks and, and to perpetuate racism and sexism and ableism. And we, we really have to be explicit about that. So that's one of the other reasons why I uh, use the solidarity economy framework. Um, But I really enjoy what I do. You know, I feel very fortunate to be able to work with really brilliant organizers and activists and co-ops and people who are thinking in a really innovative way about what's possible. So much of the work that I do is really about what's possible and also reimagining what currently exists in ways that actually work for communities that I care about. So I I really feel very fortunate to do this work. 
And, uh, and again, just see my role more of us as a, a support to a lot of the, the on the ground, very grassroots work that people are doing. So I have it that co-ops are seen as a white movement, particularly more focused as a white hippie tofu eating movement. And I have it, Renee, that the hippies just found out about it, but this uh, cooperative movement came over on the boats from West Africa, uh, South, Southern Africa, used this, uh, and the tribes, everybody in the tribe had to have their work. They're, they were responsible. If somebody didn't do their job, the whole it hurt the whole community. So it, this, this thing of coming together for the benefit of all, uh, I think, is at the core of humanity. Uh, and it comes from Africa, particularly West Africa, through the boats, through slavery. And that's what got us out of slavery, I believe, in talking about history. That got us through slavery. Us taking our little breadcrumbs and putting them together and creating uh, churches and historically black colleges and borrow monies to boroughs and money to get by people out of slavery and all of that. What do you think about that? Exactly. I, I really appreciate you making that point, right? Because while sometimes the perception is that, you know, the co-ops are and the co-op movement is this very kind of white centric hippie space, you know, we know that there's a longstanding history, certainly with black folks, both in this country and in, and looking at indigenous African cultures uh, that were very much communal in nature. That's actually a lot of the research that I'm doing right now is thinking about what existed even prior to, right, the institution of slavery so much, you know, just coming off of black history. So often we start at a place where uh, we start with slavery and thinking about the contributions of black folks and to almost the erasure of all of the accomplishments on the continent before we got here. And so a lot of what I'm looking at now are both indigenous societies that use concepts and governance principles like Ubuntu, I am because we are, or Mbangi, which was really a system of governance between um, in a lot of West African cultures where everyone was uh, participating, everyone had buy-in in terms of the decisions of you know, the society or the tribe, and they found that they had better outcomes because of it, right? So that very much is about democracy. That very much is about valuing people and giving everyone agency in their own communities and, and very much what I see and the work that I support here in Chicago. Okay, so I know Ubuntu, but what was the second, the governance piece? What was that called? Mbangi. Mbangi was a widespread kind of system of governance, and it means a house with uh, no walls, basically. But it was basically the ways in which uh, tribes came together to make decisions. And I certainly want to um, big up, uh, Jessica gordon Nimpart's work, which is so fantastic and really has exposed so many of us to the history of slaves, Africans in the U.S., and, and our history and some of that as well. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll be right back, everybody. Please don't touch that dial. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. We have Renee Hatcher on today, who is an attorney. I have a lot to say. We just covered a lot in this first segment. Uh, we talked about a solidarity economy, people working together for the benefit of everybody. That's what co-ops are all about, making sure that people have their needs met in a society. We began to talk about Ubuntu and Mbunji. Uh, in Bungie, the governance were we don't a house without walls, which means that people communicate. And Africans found out that works better when everybody can have a say, and that's what co-ops are all about. So, Renee, how did you get into this work? I mean, how did you get into becoming a lawyer and in this work? What can you tell us your your history? Yeah. Oh, that's a long story. <laughs> Um, because I think a lot of this comes from my lived experiences. So I grew up in Gary, Indiana. Some people know Gary because it's the birthplace of Michael Jackson. But also, you know, Gary has a very rich history in um, organizing, labor organizing. 
certainly organizing around local government. Uh, my father was actually the first elected black mayor of a major U.S. city. And a lot of both his work prior to being elected, as well as his work in office, was really about the self-determination and um, equality of rights and access for black people um, and trying to use political power to do that. And so I think a lot of how I came to this work is um, really trying to figure out the limitations of political power, like the, the need to expand what it looks like. Uh, in terms of our organizing work, in terms of collective action and economic power, and, and also the ways in which the current system really hurts certainly cities like Gary. You know, you, you see around the country these cities that, that uh, at some point typically are majority black in part because there's industry there and there's white flight to the suburbs and the, the complete devastation and disinvestment and Some people even go so far as to call them throwaway cities. And so Gary was very much that. And even though I had a very, you know, I had a very good experience growing up, I also obviously could see the the ways in which the city was devastated by our current system, economic system, even beyond local politics, even beyond what was possible. And so really in my work, uh, I went to law school to figure out how to change things. I was in some ways, very naive, I always say, uh, in thinking that, you know, lawyers can be change agents, and, and they absolutely can, but I think it took me a while of, um, of actually being on the ground, doing different kinds of organizing, doing different kinds of legal work to kind of figure out what was possible, certainly within the system that currently exists. And I started at the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights after law school, And I was doing prisoners' rights work and employment discrimination and housing discrimination work and really got very frustrated with the limitations of the legal system and the harm that it often does, certainly to black communities, uh, and eventually kind of made my way into doing community development law, which basically means, again, at a very basic level, working with communities to enact their own visions to further community and neighborhood self-determination. So representing small businesses and nonprofits, but also thinking about how do we change the economic development system in ways that actually create healthy communities specifically for black and Latinx folks or people who typically do not have power or access. And I um, really, through a process of doing and reflecting, saw the limitations of just doing kind of individual small business work or just um, helping one black entrepreneur you know, uh, grow his particular business and become individually wealthy, which is good work. And I think that's certainly part of uh, what we should be doing, but it's also very limited in terms of its overall impact on the black community. And so I, um, I started to do some, some really deep reflecting about that and got much more deep into collective action, cooperative development, I learned a lot about the history of my own city in Gary in terms of uh, the rich history of cooperative development with a uh, consumer trading company in Gary, which was really brought out in, in terms of the, um, in the wake of the Great Depression, 20 black families in Gary got together at Roosevelt High School to start a buying club because, you know, a lot of folks had lost their, their uh, jobs. And times were tight, and so they started collectively buying groceries. And ultimately, those 20 families turned into a system of more than five cooperatives that were interlocking. They had a women's guild, and they had a youth uh, cooperative that operated a candy store, an ice cream shop. They had several gas stations. They had two grocery stores. And beyond that, they were thinking about the larger overall solution to the issues of Black folks in Gary at the time. And so, you know, that was certainly a moment of inspiration for me in thinking about the long history, specifically in the black community around cooperative development. And why didn't I know about that already? You know, why didn't, why weren't we doing this? Why weren't we uh, really um, bringing back some of these solutions that we know have been effective in the black community around issues of cooperation and mutualism? So I would say it was a journey. It was a lot of learning along the way. So you went from father, who was mayor of Gary, so you're in the political home, I guess 
politics are talked about at the dinner table. And then somewhere in study, you say, okay, let's be a lawyer, and I can help do that. I can help change. I want to change. I want to be a change agent. And you realize that you have to deal with the economy also, money and politics. And that got you over to the solidarity economy and cooperatives and history of looking at. Now, why you said, why didn't you know that? Do you have any sense of why you weren't taught about these co-ops during the Great Depression and how they created in your in your educational play? Because I wasn't taught it either, but I'm just curious what you may have found. Yeah, well, I think, you know, more or less, you know, both in our educational system, but also we need to recognize these histories. Sometimes they're forgotten. Sometimes people don't necessarily highlight them. They're not accessible. But, you know, we capitalism is at its core, right, really – uh, ensures the survival of the current system of the status quo. And so these aren't things that we're taught about in school. You know, gratefully, Jessica gordon Nimhard's work in Collective Courage, right, talks a, quite a bit about this. Also, Caroline Hussein, who writes extensively about cooperative development in the Black diaspora. We, we are just kind of being reconnected with these histories in a way that I think is is so important, um, and I think finding ways in which to ensure that you know folks coming up know about it is, is really important. But also the contributions of people like Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer and Ida B. Wells, right? And and really having um, deeper conversations about this, right? And so sometimes I think that um, looking at tools like Freedom Schools and Teach-ins are really important, just in terms of activating people around these really rich histories and cooperative development in the black community is so important. So you went right into Women's History Month when you named those folks. Uh, Jessica gordon Nimhard has been on the show four times or so, and I love, I just keep learning from her, keep growing, keep learning. Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Jo Baker. Uh, and when you talk about school, there was a Highlander school that a lot of civil rights folks like Martin Luther King and Road the Parks went to, which was interesting. And, but you did not mention my favorite, which is Murray McLeod Bethune. And the reason she's my favorite, because I live in D.C., and I I take the exit off of the highway at the Murray McLeod Bethune exit, and I've been to her school and so forth. And she had these different businesses back in the day with, what was that, in, in the 40s and 50s. So it's, it's great. It's a tremendous history, but we're not taught it. Why? Why are we not taught it? I would say it's intentional, but also I think it's up to us, right, to create these community spaces where we can introduce folks to these histories, right, where we, we are ensuring, right, that kind of passage of knowledge, that Sankofa of looking back to move forward. And I do think that people are doing wonderful work around this and really leading with this. I've been encouraged by so many grassroots organizations who are activating, like, young uh, black folks and people of color, movement generation being one example, where they're teaching these histories and talking about like, this rich legacy of cooperative development and the need to, to incorporate it into our lives and to think differently and uh, really be proud of, of so much of, of what so many have accomplished. Okay, so... I have it over over the last seven and a half years of asking that question. Is that it is intentional that the one percenters don't want people to know about co-ops, don't want people to know about this solidarity economy, because it means that people will form these worker co-ops and other co-ops. They will have the profit, and these one percenters won't. And I think that's one reason. The other reason I've been told, like credit unions, for a long time would not say that they were co-ops. And they would not say they were co-ops because they were considered socialist organizations or communism organizations, and they were afraid of getting that label, so they, they would not. They would drop the co-op in, in the word. It makes sense to me that that's perhaps why not, those two reasons. But we're going to talk about it. I love what Jessica gordon Nimhart has put out. I love her book. And I also like what you said about Sankofa, looking back to move forward. So when we come off our second break, I want to talk more about moving forward. What does it look like coming out of these pandemics? We'll be right back with Renee.
Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Co-op. And we have Dr. Renee Hatcher on the line with her, who's a researcher and attorney. And we just heard that list of names um, that WL put out on Women's History Month. And I see, in talking to her and having first met her at a panel discussion with Jessica Guggera and Nimhart, and we had her on last year with Dr. Nimhart, that her name would be in that list one day. Renee, it's absolute pleasure talking to you and hearing about the research that you are doing in your clinic. So what what are some of the things that you, your clinic and your school is doing to prepare us for the future? Yeah, thanks so much. So, you know, in addition to the work that we do in the community or with clients or in advocacy, um, a lot of my work is also focused on thinking about how do we enact and reimagine both the law so we can have the kind of society and economy that we deserve, but also how do we undo some of the, the really harmful aspects of the law to some of this work. And so, you know, there's a couple of projects that I'm really excited about right now, one of which is really thinking about both the solidarity economy movement and the abolitionist movement or the movement to um, completely um, get rid of the carceral state, right? So how do we get rid of prisons? How do we uh, disband the police and ensure that people are still safe? Um, and I, you know, my answer to that question is really not only, and, and obviously so many folks have talked about not only the need to undo what exists, but also to reimagine what, what the new Right. How do we reimagine society in a way that people can be safe and flourish uh, without the carceral state um, and have agency over their own lives and feel um, uh, nourished? And so, so much of that to me is not only about um, the state, but it's also about our economic system. And so I think solidarity economy is one way for us to think about getting to um, and inventing the new institutions that actually allow us to get to abolitionist vision. So what does it look like to have um, child care cooperatives? And what does it look like to have uh, community-controlled um, institutions that deal with issues of public safety or that deal with mental health crises, that people in the community actually have ownership and power in terms of how they are instituted, how they actually go about programming, how they engage folks, Right. And so really thinking about new ways of organizing institutions that serve all of us. So, again, like that's a project really about this idea of the connections and the need for the abolitionist movement to uh, look to solidarity economy strategies. And then also I'm uh, working on a research project that kind of speaks to issues of decolonizing businesses and nonprofit organizations with the idea that what currently is in place is, uh, very much from a single kind of uh, Eurocentric perspective of hierarchy and uh, the maximization of profit and shareholder supremacy. Um, and so what does it look like to actually um, pull from indigenous cultures of governance and what, how can we think about how culture actually uh, solves problems? Um, so thinking about new ways to reorganize businesses and nonprofits and a new way of doing things, like, again, looking at the practices of indigenous cultures, uh, specifically African communal cultures. And then I'm really excited about a project that just launched, which my clinic is a part of here at UIC. It's called the UIC Portal Project. And the idea being that pandemics can be portals, right, to new futures, to um, opportunities to transform society. And so that, uh, by and large, is uh, led by Barbara Ramsey, who is such an inspiration at the Social Justice Initiative at UIC. And it's really a, a fantastic project to bring together scholars and activists and organizers and artists to think about transforming right, society, not only our economy, but society more broadly, our political system. And so that just launched recently, and we're going to be kicking off with a number of programs over the course of the year. Okay, so I'm excited about all three of those. How can I play? And uh, particularly that last one, this social justice portal, get, looking at we, – we got – I have it that we have five pandemics. Uh, Dr. Hatcher, I'm going to call you Dr. Hatcher. Keep, so. <laughs> so 
know, a JD doesn't necessarily mean that I'm a doctor. But, uh, prof- well, I have JD is a Jewish doctorate. Okay, mm-hmm. I, and the first time I got this was I in 1972 to 74. I taught at San Diego State College, and we had JDs on staff, blacks on staff, and they were called doctors with that JD. Same thing at Howard uh, when I taught there. So uh, when I talk to you and listen to what you're about, I get excited and want to give you the respect of what that doctorate calls for. That's what we call you, Dr. Hatcher. We can take it or not. Okay, okay. <laughs> Answer or not. But there are five pandemics, Dr. Hatchet. COVID-19, racism, which we saw with the murder of George Floyd. It, it was uncovered. And then the economy from COVID-19 and all of this history of capitalism and the money going to these one percenters, climate change, which we see um, with the ice in Texas and the fires in California and Washington. And then the fifth one, which I think is what causes all of those four to persist, is stupidity. And so I think from what you're talking about, particularly social justice as a portal, that that. All, uh, all of these issues, all of these pandemics, if we can get people knowledgeable about them and how they just perpetuate themselves, and when there's a hurricane, it doesn't, it doesn't care how much money you have. It's going to come in and, and wipe us out. When, it, when fires start happening in, in these hills in California, it didn't care how rich you were or how poor you were. It just wiped out everybody. The rich could recover better, but the causes of climate change – and I would say the causes of racism and COVID-19, they hurt everybody. The economy, the rich have gotten richer with the poor economy, and the poor have gotten these longer food lines. So I really like what you're talking about. So my question is, I just spoke with Carmen Hoytus Noble out of uh, John Jay Clinic, and she was working with a brother named Anthony Cook, who's gotten the dean's approval to create a center at Georgetown. And are you guys working together, all of these legal clinics that share data and information and get them in also involved with what you are doing in this social justice portal project? So, okay, so I love your five pandemics, and I certainly would argue that they're all connected, right? So in terms of thinking about the climate crisis that we're in and the perpetuation of racism, Right. It, all of that to me is intertwined in the capitalist system. Right? Capitalism and racism are certainly compounding and you know, redundant when, when we say things like racial capitalism. We know that racism is certainly bound up in the capitalist system, certainly. And, uh, and that capitalism, by and large, has put us in the situation that we're in in terms of the climate crisis. So all of those things seem intertwined to me de- de- definitely. And I think part of it, too, is that this idea of like, well, how do we get out of it? I think people know, right? People are are living these conditions. I think the thing that we need to do is not necessarily make sure that people are more knowledgeable about it, because I think they are knowledgeable because of their lived experiences. But I think we need to ensure that people really feel like and believe that it can be different, that things don't have to be this way, that we can create new systems and new ways of thinking and being and engaging and working. And the pandemic has revealed so much about all of this, certainly. And thank you for bringing up Carmen. Carmen is is definitely a good friend and colleague. I really appreciate the work that she does. And we're all in community together, these different clinics that do similar types of work. Certainly, I'm very familiar with the really fantastic work that Carmen does out of CUNY Law School. And, you know, we we see each other, or we used to see each other pre-pandemic regularly at at conferences. And there are so, you know, so many folks who are doing really good work out of these law school clinics and providing legal support to really help communities uh, transform themselves to enact their own vision. And again, like I think one of the things that I hope people take away is that part of what we need to do is like shift our thinking and... Uh, be really bold and and being willing to reimagine what currently exists, reimagine institutions. And that's the work that so many people are doing. I think that the pandemic has exposed even further in terms of all of the mutual aid um, initiatives that cropped up when people couldn't necessarily access food 
or when folks uh, were at risk of eviction, ensuring that landlords couldn't come into court and throw people out of their houses, right, in the wake of the pandemic. But we also have to understand that many communities, Black, Latinx, lots of folks have been in a perpetual crisis. We've been in a perpetual economic crisis prior to COVID, certainly. Folks have been trying to figure out how to access and uh, just be able to pay for all the things that they need. And so while I think the, the pandemic has exposed so many of the fundamental issues that we really need to solve, this has been going on, right, since certainly the beginning of, of the system in this country. It has been going on. And we talk about marginalized communities, and you've named them blacks and browns and the marginalized with the way the white men have treated women. All of that, Native Americans particularly, if you look at how they have been treated, how when the white folks came over and started Thanksgiving and sort of celebrating and then killing off them and taking their land and whatever else they wanted to take. So all of this marginalized. But see, I have it, when I talk about the stupidity, I'm going to push back a little bit. The knowledge that I'm talking about is to poor white people. Mm-hmm. They're in the same group. They're in the same baggage. And I grew up in Bluefield, West Virginia, on top of a hill, and we were all working poor. And we all had the same little bit of. We all ran around barefoot, white, black. It just didn't make it. We didn't have Hispanics. I had one African lady. or She was from one of the islands. But we didn't have all of these different international cultures. But we all grew up poor, and the whites, when they went away to whites to the first grade and came back, they thought they were better than us. They got the knowledge that they were better than uh, somebody and uh, and us. And so I saw that. But what Dr. Barber is trying to teach white folks, and you see a lot of his videos going around North Carolina, teaching them, we're in the same boat. And how do we come together and solve this issue and this solidarity is, white people and black people and brown people and natives, men and women, Republicans and Democrats. I don't don't know about that, but anyway, (laughs) Democrats. Okay. So who, all of us, how do we come together, remove away these, these barriers that have been put up and perpetuated so that the rich can make money off the poor, keeping the poor poor so that they can have labor to man their manufacturing firm at seven bucks an hour, fifteen bucks an hour, and have total control over the dollars that come in. That's mm-hmm. that's the yeah. knowledge I want people to know. Yeah. Okay. No, and I think I think that's right. And I think it goes back to this idea, right, that racism and capitalism are intertwined and that racism has been used as a tool, right, to ensure that capitalism survives and the way in which white supremacy, right, is is used to ensure that folks act against their interests, specifically, you know, uh, working class, low income, or impoverished white folks. And so I definitely think that that's part of it, as well as patriarchy and the way in which sexism works. Um, You know, all of these things are used as tools, I think, to divide us to ensure that, that this exploitative economic system survives. So I would, you know, I would venture to agree with you and so much of what we need to do is is continue to organize right across all of the well, lines. We're going to come right back. Please don't touch that down. <laughs> you Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Cooperative. This program has been on the air a little over seven years, seven and a half years. The National Cooperative Bank has been our sponsor they've provided money and knowledge and they've been sort of our cheerleaders ncb's mission is to support and be an advocate for america's cooperatives and their members especially dr hatcher and low-income communities by providing innovative financial and related services and what you have been talking about in chicago and illinois and indiana is low-income communities uh, and that's where ncb has been doing a lot of its its work throughout the years. So in this last segment, I'd like to know how I, how I can find out about this social justice portal and become a part of it. I wanted to be a fly on the wall, but no, I really want to participate in that and finding out how we can transform our economy and let the, the coronavirus and these other pandemics be a way, an opening to really change our society. 
particularly economic, economic and political. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, folks, if you're interested in learning more about the Portal Project, you can go to uh, sji.uic.edu backslash Portal Project, and you'll see basically um, the outlines of the the project and what's to come. You know, there's some really fantastic, really amazing organizers and speakers who are going to be engaging in the project and including people like Angela Davis and Robin Kelly and Naomi Klein and um, uh, uh, so many, Kianga, Yamada Taylor, who I was trying to think of, uh, but also local organizers who, who are doing really amazing work in and out of Chicago. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. And you can certainly sign up to get any of the updates in terms of the pork project. Um, and then the other way I think folks can always tap in is they really figure out what's going on in their own community. There's so much that people are doing right now. Um, again, as I mentioned, what I've been really encouraged by in the wake of the pandemic are all of the mutual aid networks that have so uh, quickly developed or grassroots organizations that started mutual aid projects and really trying to engage in that work and, and uh, really respond to the immediate needs of people in, in the moment of, uh, of this crisis and in this pandemic. And so I always encourage folks to figure out what's going on in their own communities, to get involved, and to, to figure out how they can contribute. I think we all have certainly something to contribute right, to making things uh, better, to actually addressing so many of these issues and, and moving toward uh, transformation uh, in our society. Okay, so I'm all the way back to S-J-I <laughs> dot U-I-C dot E-D-U backslash portal, P-O-R-T-A-L hyphen P-R-O-J-E-C-T. Exactly. Now, I got that because I tried to put in what I thought I heard you say, and it didn't come up. So if you're interested in this, what does S-J-I stand for? The Social Justice Initiative at UIC. Okay. Uh, so at, the director is well, Barbara uh, Ramsey. All right, Go ahead. Be Social Justice Initiative, SJI dot UIC, University of Illinois at Chicago dot EDU. Mm -hmm. So that's the first piece of it. That's the project and backslash portal project. Okay. So, so it says sign up for portal project updates. I will do that. Mapping vision for transformative change. Okay, uh, and I would encourage you to everybody out there to do that if you're interested in this transformative change of how we change our economy so that we don't go back to normal. Normal in the past, don't want. I don't want that. I do not like being on the other side of it. And I've done fairly good, uh, Renee Hatcher. I've done fairly good in this capitalistic society, particularly where I grew up in Bluefield. But I see most of my family members and friends uh, that I grew up with did not make it through. So somewhere God looked after me from this, and it's almost luck or trip. I don't know what mm -hmm. makes the difference for those blacks that do make it out of it and create some nuggets and a few dollars and have a net worth. But I'm, I'm amazed that the average white family in the U.S. has $171,000 worth of net worth of value, financial value. And blacks only have seventeen thousand dollars in net worth, and if you're a single black head of household, the net worth on average is negative six dollars. Mm -hmm. So if you're a black woman head of household, the likelihood is you owe more than you own, and if you are just a black family, it just says that you own so much less than what a white family owes because of racism and Jim Crow and redlining and all of that history. So that's why I don't want to go back to that. I don't, don't want mm -hmm. nothing to do with that. And I would really want what you guys are talking about in this portal project and the research you are doing. So, okay. Anything, anything else you want to say about this portal project? And I also want to get back to using solidarity economy uh, and its abolitionist vision. How do you, how do you do that? But let's, anything else you want to say about the portal project first? Yeah, and you know, I think the Portal Project, I think you, you raised a lot of good points, right? The Portal Project is really about what does transformational change look like? Not do, just how do we deal with things like, you know, the racial wealth gap, which is 
real and I think it's helpful for us to understand the current conditions. But, you know, and again, not just to make a couple of more black folks more wealthy, but how do we fundamentally change society, economy, um, uh, society in such a way that actually brings about uh, justice and fulfills the humanity of everyone. Um, and one of the things I always like to say in terms of this idea of wealth building, you know, the the opposite, there's a, a quote that basically says, goes to the effect of, you know, the opposite of uh, pov- poverty isn't wealth, the opposite of, of poverty is justice. And that speaks to me really the need to ensure that everybody has what they need, not just to necessarily make sure that people are wealthy, but that they can live, you know, dignified, healthy, flourishing lives and actually um, have control and agency over their futures. So I'm always more interested, and really this has come from a process of doing this work and reflecting on it and thinking about the limitations of it. I'm always more interested in thinking about how do we – how do we think about these various systems in such a way where we can transform them as opposed to making capitalism or racism or sexism or patriarchy a little bit nicer at the end of the day? Well said. I'm all for it. I really like it. And see if we can quote you. The opposite of poverty isn't wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. Okay. Social justice, political justice, economic justice, but all of the systems And I have it, though, that the more wealth a family has, the better housing they can have, the better education they can have, the better health care they can have. Uh, The the number one reason for divorces is normally finance, somewhere in Mm -hmm. finance and communications, but communications a lot of times is about finance or lack thereof. So having having everything that we think about when, when we grow up about what makes a society better, Having these, this justice is critical to it. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you wholeheartedly. How do we get more people involved in this in this think tank, in this Porter project? Well, again, I think everyone has a website now, so you can sign up for updates. And, again, I think this is also about really not just this one particular project, but thinking about how people in their current communities and their spaces how do we start to dare to reimagine what exists in a way that actually recognizes and fulfills everyone's humanity? And so, again, I always encourage folks to want to study, obviously. You know, there are um, so many folks who are so really forward-looking and, and also just uh, so much of a rich history of struggle and organizing that we have to draw from, but also to find ways in which they can contribute and to get involved into what currently exists in their communities. I think relationships are really important. I think there is something that's like um, inherently valuable about the local and really, you know, knowing and building trust, which I think is, is definitely necessary, right, to bring about this kind of transformation that we're talking about. One of the things that I find in my work and certainly working with co-ops is that this isn't just about transforming the economy, but it's also about the personal transformation that we have to do and how we have to engage differently with folks. And sometimes that's the hardest part. Uh, we have to unlearn what we've been socialized to think and to do in terms of our relationships with each other. But also, you know, to the extent that we're doing that work, it's, it's also one of the most, I think, rewarding parts of being able to, to be in space and community uh, with each other and solidarity with each other and make sure that those spaces are filled with joy, right? And uh, and we're doing the work that we need to be doing. So everybody out there, go to sji.uic.edu backslash portal project to find out about this project to get more. Also, if you want to hear Dr. Hatcher, you can go to www.everything.coop. That's our web page. You can get this show. You can get another 240 different shows to, to learn about this solidarity economy. Last 30 seconds, Dr. Hatcher, would you like to leave people with? I certainly would ask folks to dare to imagine that things can be better and be different than what currently exists, to question our current system, and to be willing to come together with others to actually make sure that we're moving in the right direction. Fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time out to be here with us today, Dr. Hatcher. And everybody out there, we'll see you next Thursday. 
please live this week cooperatively, working for with each other in Ubuntu. I am because you are, and you are because I am. Thank you.